you. Thank you very much, Pastor Ian. I, I just do as I'm told. They told me to use this mic, so I'm using this mic. Again, I'd like to acknowledge my, my wife, the wife of my youth. I'm a very privileged man to have been married to this girl for 33 uninterrupted years. Don't you want to stand? I know your leg is sore, but stand and let them see what jackpot I hit. Come on, come on. I didn't just hit the pokies. I hit the jackpot over and over. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the privilege to be able to come into this holy place. Pray that you sanctify our words, sanctify our mind. Thank you that the offering that we're bringing to you right now in word and in deed and in talent and in revelation will be acceptable to you. And Lord, that your word will not go back to you void in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I want you to uh, turn your attention to John chapter, 15. John chapter 15. It says, I am the vine, this is Jesus talking, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, he prunes it and that they may, sorry, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of its own, of itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And again he says in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burnt. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. I have had the privilege to, and this guy doesn't even know, I, I was watching Jim in Pastor's garden Jim was going, it's a very beautiful garden. I don't know how many of you have been to Pastor Ian's house. It's a very nice garden in the front. And in order for it to look good, look the way it does, it needs a gardener, needs someone to take the weed, the weeds out, needs someone to pull out all the junk, cut out all the dead leaves, cut out all the dead branches, etc., etc. And uh, <clears throat> he's got to be very careful what grows in that garden. Is that right? And I know the Australians are very finicky about what comes into your country. Yeah, seeds and, and, and branches and bark and, you know, wood. And you've got to declare everything. <laughs> so they are very strict about what comes in. So at your borders, they're very strict. The question is, how strict am I in my garden? Now, I want to spiritualize this thing. Because there are many, many things that come into our garden and we think, oh, pretty, nice little flower. It's just attached itself to one of my beautiful trees. Now, you get what you call parasite plants. Is that right? Jim, help me. Where's Jim? There he is. Uh, you're the expert. I'm not really a plant expert. But I have seen what devastation, an incoming thing that's not supposed to be there, what it actually can do to one's garden. So what comes into your garden is going to have an effect as to what grows there and what bears fruit. Amen? Many times we do not actually take care. And I, I can see the guys who actually love their gardens and who do not love their gardens. They just put paving there. <laughs> my father-in-law is, is one, I don't know if you've met my father-in-law, he, he's got green fingers. He would plant something and take care of it. And every night he would water that garden. Nowadays, you, you know, you get these automated sprinklers and you just, you know, the thing goes off by a, by a timer, etc. You don't even have to water it anymore. And now when we had a garden in, in Johannesburg, I used to love my time in the garden. Yes, we had automatic sprinklers, but I preferred to take the hose pipe and stand there and talk to God as I see the growth and as I see the beautiful things and as I see all this wonderful new life come into this garden. And I had so many metaphors coming at me, lots of sermons coming at me. And there was this one time, uh, <clears throat> we bought a, a house in Cape Town, South Africa, Somerset West. 
I don't know how many of you know what that is. That is, that is you put a canopy over it, and you get an old age home. <laughs> it's a more of a retirement type of place. But we bought this very lovely house. But as we came into this place, what sold it for us was the garden in the back. It had three very beautiful looking trees. And the one in particular, I said to the tree, said, wow, I really like this tree. And this tree was right in the, in the middle. And it was casting nice shade because we have sunshine that beat up on us, just like you guys. So it's nice to have a big tree. But it was actually sort of covering the, the, the pool and all that stuff. And so, Trisha, being the one who loves to be in the garden most more than I do, she went and started working in this garden. And she saw that there was something not nice about this particular tree. There was an invader that came. And she started cutting off the twine, or what is it, the, the vine, she cutting off the vine of this invader. But she only came to a certain point because she couldn't get any higher, and she just started taking it off, and this thing went. Next thing, in the middle of the night, the great southeaster, Cape Town has what we call the black southeaster. But it was just a, a normal southeaster that came through our garden, and whoosh, blew this whole tree over. And Trisha woke me up. She said, Trevor, your tree's in the pool. I said, what do you mean? She said, your tree's in the pool. <laughs> and I went to inspect, and my heart just sank. I thought, oh, my lovely tree. <laughs> there it is, branches and all. in the." But then I looked. I said, am I seeing right? And I went to inspect by this tree, and I looked, and the inside, it was fruit. It was rotten. It was rotten. I thought, Whoa! And I looked and I said, there's a whole lot of green on this. There was a whole lot of green leaves on this tree. And what actually happened, the neighbors have what they call an ivy. Do you guys have ivy? ivy are the ivy here? Dangerous piece of thing. Yeah. The ivy came, was planted by our neighbor next door. Many years. Battery flat? No, signal. <laughs> Many years before we came to that particular property, the neighbor planted the ivy. But the ivy made its way up onto the fence, draped itself, and everyone said, oh, very nice covering. And so the gardeners that were before us only took care of the ivy that was on the fence. And the gardeners that came in and did our garden only just took care of the ivy leaves. Meanwhile, this ivy was digging its roots in. It was invading my garden. And it was coming in and killing everything in its way. Until it got to this tree and wrapped itself around this tree. Little by little by little by little. Right to the finest, the smallest little branch. An invader faking the glory of this tree who had already been strangled to death. I said to myself, this is the type of the church. This is the type of the church where we allow, we, where we don't deal with the thing at its root level. It's coming in, an invader is coming into my garden and we actually get into this thing. We like this thing coming in because it looks so good. And it takes a position, and it looks all the more nice. It's giving very nice shade, so I'm going to leave it alone. Have you heard that word already? Just leave it alone. It's nice. Everybody's got it. Everybody's doing it. So that neighbors were probably into that ivy in the big time. And so were the owners of my house before us, because they didn't deal with that thing. So everywhere I looked, there was ivy roots. And then I looked, they were, these things were going up other trees as well. There were, there were another tree, there was another tree that was messed up, couldn't bear fruit. The ivy just took it over. It was a berry tree. And you know the birds need the berries. It started strangling that tree as well. So I said to our oldest son, I said, we, we got work to do, my boy. I said, get a pick. Is that what you call it in English? A couple of shovels. I said, we're going to deal with this thing at its root level. Because I'm not into ivy. 
I don't like Ivy, and that's not the woman, eh? <laughs> the woman Ivy. <laughs> I mean, Patricia. <laughs> but I'm not into Ivy. I don't like the Ivy. I don't like what the Ivy has done. And so I'm not just going to cut off the little leaves and some branches. I'm going to deal with it at its root level. So from the point of devastation, from the point of showing its manifestation that is supposedly a tree. In fact, it was a fake tree. Couldn't stand by itself. It needed the support of this tree. Meanwhile, it took out all the sap and took all the glory in the middle of my garden. So I'm going to take this thing out. Take it out at its root level. And Jason and I, our hands were sore. There was a lot of effort taken as we took care of what is in our garden. All those roots were taken out. And like the Bible says, the one who takes care of the garden breaks down and burns out all the stuff that is of no value, that bears no fruit. And that's what I did. I broke it down, took it all out. Next thing I looked, there's a wall. This ivy has gone that way as well. It invaded. Listen, everywhere you looked was just ivy. Now the the, I, I discovered that the rats like the ivy bed. And I was wondering <laughs> why we had some rats running around. When I inspected, under that beautiful lush green, there by the wall was a rat's nest. The ivy was giving a hiding place for more. What am I saying? You let the one demon in, the other demons will follow. You let the one wrong thing in, the other stuff will come in. You just leave one little open door, it will come in. So I had to deal with the rats as well. <laughs> the next thing I saw, there's a, there's, a, there's a big crack in my wall. <laughs> and when I looked, I thought, hmm, this thing started probably small because the ivy comes in as a small little stungle. What's a stungle? A stem. A small little stem, it makes its way through the smallest little crack and then starts growing. And the food comes and the ivy grows. And the food comes and the ivy grows and it makes its way into your home. I've seen it. What am I saying? So many times we allow these things to come in through the little cracks, through the little holes. We don't maintain, we don't take care, we, don't, we just are careless. Oh, the ivy's growing nice. I'm just going to get someone else to just keep it nice. Just, it looks nice on there. Yes, it looks nice, but it's going to mess up your home. Before you know it, your whole home is going to be wrapped around the ivy, with the ivy. I'm using a metaphor here. So who are you into? And what's into you? Who is it whose manifestations you want to show, whose life, whose character, whose fruit you need to show? Or is there something else covering up and not even bearing any fruit? It's just making a nice little shade. Question I ask myself, what I bring home is going to influence my home. So if I bring praise home, my home will be influenced with praise. If I bring worship home, my home will be influenced with worship. And it will flush out every operation of the enemy. Amen? So I, I, I just use this little, this little, this little uh, uh, metaphor of the, of the ivy just to make us aware of what possibly could happen. If you do not deal with the thing at root level, it's going to take over your whole life. And that thing will get into you in a big way. And before you know it, you are bound. You are bound and you can't get free. My family home was not a Christian family home. The devil ruled there big time. When you talk about demons, they were there. Because the people in our home were so needy that they tried every trick in the book to try and get a solution. Including Jesus. But they didn't want to walk the obedient walk of Jesus. They just wanted the benefits of Jesus. They just wanted the provision. They just wanted the breakthrough. And I know there are many Christians today going from conference to conference, speaker to speaker, because they will get their breakthrough. But they're not prepared to deal with the root of what is controlling them and what they're into and what's into them. 
So it's very important that we deal with that thing at its root level. Now, now this is not some kind of condemnation thing. I understand the blessings of obedience. And blessings come from obedience. But I can't expect for my neighbor to deal with my roots in my home. Oh, I've got a, I've got a good Christian neighbor. He's going to be praying for me. I've asked him to pray for me. I have an intercessor. That's not good enough. You need to tap into the root of all. The way, the truth, the life, Jesus Christ. And don't call him that other, that whatever it is. You know, give him his name. His name is Jesus. Yes. Yeshua Messiah. And for the Muslims, Isa. That's what the Muslims call him. And may I say, the Muslims also revere Jesus as, as their, one of their main prophets. The, the problem that they have really is to actually not accept Jesus as the son of the living God. That's where the thing is going wrong. Otherwise, a whole lot of other stuff that they do is wonderful. They put us to shame. They deal with things that come into their house. Do you know that if I want to influence a Muslim child with Christianity... That father will come after me. He'll come and fetch his child because he's already indoctrinated his child into the way of the Muslim faith. And if anyone shows a threat to the Muslim faith, especially the children, you're going to have that guy. That guy's going to get violent. I grew up with the Muslims. But we, we let anything and everyone just control and influence our children. Control and influence our homes. So my question, the big question is, what are we into? Who are we into? And let me emphasize the scripture. Jesus said, if you, that means you, every one of you, if you abide in me, and my word abide in you. Very key. I have to have Jesus living in me. We sing that song, I've got the life of God in me. I've got the life of God in me. I've got his life, his nature, and his ability. It's not just a nice children's song. That's the truth. So if you've invited Jesus into your life, you've already on the, on the, on the way to success. In your marriage, in your home, in your business. Don't try any of the other gimmicks. There are some people that want to break through in their finances. They come to Heritage of Faith. They tithe very well, but then they go to the, to the Masons, the secret society. God is seeing what you're getting into. And that thing, if it gets into you, because you see, that thing is the love of money. We need to love, be lovers of God. And what Jesus is saying, if you abide in me, if you have intimacy with me, if you have fellowship with me, you will bear my fruit. You will bear much fruit, and my Father will be glorified. But if you go into any other thing, you mix the thing up. And this is why you're having these phone calls. Now, they didn't talk to me about this. These phone calls late in the night. Pastor, the demons are bothering me. You deal with the demons in your house. Come and give the pastor sleepless nights because of your demonic activity, because of your choice to get into something. You made the choice. Deal with it. Get the thing out by the root. And some of your fathers are, are saying, I, I, I don't know what is, what is going on with my, with my child, but I'm seeing him getting into pornography. I'm seeing my daughter. She's now getting into, into all kinds of funny stuff. In fact, she's pregnant now. Have you asked yourself the question, what have you been busy with? What has gotten into you? And your children and your family didn't even know about what you're getting into. And yet you, you, you pray these prayers and you sing these songs, but you brought something home. What you bring home is what's going to influence your family. I don't care how long a member you have been of heritage of faith, chandaying and all. Tongue talker and all. Must deal with the thing by the root. Because you see, if you, dab, if you dabble with those funny things, your worship is fake. Your worship is fake. And the Father is seeking worshippers who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now I know some of you are going to come. I hope some of you are going to come tonight to the service. <laughs> to the worship service. And you're wanting a breakthrough. I want to encourage you. Don't come 
for a breakthrough in worship. You must break through in your worship at home. In your bedroom. Huh? All that dancing that you're doing here in front and all that shandaying and all that stuff. Can you do it in your bedroom? Do you do the thing in your house? Do you do that thing in your bathroom? Does your wife hear you? Jesus! What is into you? <laughs> and who are you into? What are you into? And this is some serious stuff. This is some very serious stuff. And you see the manifestations of who's into you and who you into will come. It will spill over in your lifestyle. Whatever it is you've made room for, whatever it is that you've allowed to, to attach itself to you. Now let me take you back to, to Lazarus and I want to try and wrap up Lazarus. Jesus did a very important thing. You know, he was teaching for three days. And Lazarus was, was already dead and he asked um, Lazarus' sisters, where have you laid him? In the meantime, Jesus was making a petition to Father God about Lazarus' resurrection. And he came to the tomb where they laid Lazarus. And he prayed a prayer. A yes key. You want to be set free from all that stuff? Pray to God. You petition God. And after he prayed... He gave thanks. He said to Father, Father, I thank you that you have heard my prayers. He didn't just go there like a mad uh, charismaniac and said, come on, open, this, open these, uh, the, 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 the tomb. Lazarus, come forth. There was a process of petitioning the Father. Your help comes from the Lord. It's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord that all your mountains must be removed. Now remember God has given us the Holy Spirit and He's given Je uh, us Jesus' name. He said, in my name you will do all these things. And don't even try to drink that holy water that that guy is trying to sell you over the television. Hey, doing that. Special prayer cloths. Special fetishes. They even sell nails of Jesus' cross. You may as well go to a witch doctor, man. Jesus said, once for all, I've done it. I've done it for you. Just in my name and by my spirit. He said, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, that all your mountains shall be removed. And that includes the root of whatever is in your garden or in your home and in your life. God can do that. If you want to let go. Maybe you can't let go. And you're still bound like Lazarus was bound. Remember, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth, but there were still grave clothes on him. Did Jesus take the grave, grave clothes off? No. He said to those standing by, looking at the miracle, he said, You take off the grave clothes. Why? And here's the revelation. Many times God does something for someone who's maybe been in either close to death or been in whatever it is, been far away from Jesus or whatever it is, and Jesus touched them with his resurrection and life-giving power and life-giving spirit, and others are still looking at that person as if it's still that old dead person. So we, as the believers, as the onlookers of the miracle, must unwrap that person from all of that stuff and stop pointing at them and say, I remember your past. You see, that's what the devil does. And don't you be an instrument of the devil to try and remind others of where they've been and what they've done. You help Jesus take off the grave clothes and restore them, restore their dignity, restore them in every way. Amen? Every life a precious one. Every life a precious one to God, whether they've been a prost prostitute, whether they've been a drug dealer, whether they've been a gambler, whether they've whatever they were, if Jesus has touched them, God has made them new. Amen? So, Jesus said, I am the vine. So I want to tap myself, continually be tapped into the vine. Not the ivy vine. The true vine. Who is Jesus? And I want to avail myself to be cut back at times. The pruning process, a lot of times, is not lekker. It's not nice. But it has to be done. Why pruning? Because that pruning process will cause you to bear more fruit. 
So if the pastors come to you and say, hey, listen, I, I see there's, there, there's, there's a little bit of a, a deadness happening, a little bit of dryness happening, you're going through the desert, don't feel guilty. It's not out of condemnation that they're doing it. They just want to see you grow. So they cut back so you can grow. Hey, Jim, you cut the roses? You cut it back. You cut it far back so they can have a bigger rose and a bolder rose with bolder colors with more beautiful looking. Amen? So a lot of times we are cut down to size. Many of us want to be up there. And some of us think that in order for God to use us, we must have a microphone in our hands. You do not need a microphone in your hands for God to use you. All you need is the power of the Holy Spirit that will lead you into Father's ways of holiness and truth. And look, Father's ways of holiness and truth is a good way. Many Christians, even charismatics, are afraid of the word of the word holy. Let me break that down for you. The word holy talks about, or the other interpretation for holy is godly order. If there's order in your life, you are well on the way to holiness. And what does the Bible say? You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Not a funny daddy people, not a weird people, but a peculiar people who will show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his Marvelous light. So I wrap up with this. So heritage of faith. Sing the hallelujahs. In the dark times. And even in the troubled times. Sing the hallelujahs. Give praise to your God. And you will see that in the midst of your praise. There is miracle working power. All those ivies will unwrap itself, will come off, they will fall off. All those roots that have, have been, been there, inside there, will just, they'll just go away in the name of Jesus. As you take on his nature, as you take on his ability, as you take on his spirit, as you activate his spirit. And this is one thing that, that I, I want to really labor in my future ministry, is that God's Holy Spirit has been sidelined for too long. He's been ignored for too long, even by the spirit-filled so-called church. Let him govern you. Let him show you the way. Let him govern you. Let him show you Father's way of holiness and truth. Let him help you to live a successful, glorious, priestly, holy life. Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that you came. That we may have life. Thank you that you are the vine. You are the true vine. And thank you, Father, that you are the vine dresser that cut back and prune us and help us by your spirit. I pray that in Jesus' name you would turn us upside down, Lord. So many gardens are turned upside down right now because we want to get to the root of what's going on there in Jesus' name. Lord, we want to be into you. We want to stay connected to you. We want to stay connected into you so that we can bear your fruit and others may be brought into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, and we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, you ask, you listen to the message today, and you ask yourself, but where do I fit in? Where does Jesus fit in my life? Maybe you're asking the question, well, if something happened to me today, I'm not quite sure I would go to heaven. I'd like the opportunity to pray with you if you would allow me. If you just repeat these words, because the Bible says that if you declare and call unto the Lord, Jesus Christ, you will be saved. So I'm going to pray a prayer and I ask you, if you pray it from your heart and confess with your mouth and believe, the Bible says you're saved. You're born again. All things are passed away and all things are new. So why don't you pray with me? Why don't you stretch your faith as I stretch my faith with you right now and let's put our faith together. I'd like to pray a prayer with you. And I ask that you repeat the prayer after me. And the Bible says, if you do it by faith, the Lord Jesus will hear and you will be saved. So repeat this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. 
I make you Lord and Savior Jesus. I know that you died, you rose again on the third day for me. So I thank you right now that I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus because I believe on the name of Jesus and have called out on the name of Jesus. If you prayed this prayer, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away and all things are new. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, we would love to get into contact with you or hear from you. Please head on down to our website www.heritageoffaith.com.au as we'd love to hear about the decision that has changed your life. God bless. We're praying for you and we look forward to seeing you soon. Love you.